So this is called a renaissance for decision tree learning. So I'm going to come in here and talk to a whole bunch of people who love neural networks, and I'm going to talk about decision trees. My goodness. Anyway, this is joint work with my PhD student, Hong Yu, uh, Marco Seltzer, who's a professor at Harvard in the computer science department, and Jocelyn Cower and Morris Chen. All right, so CART is classification and regression trees. It's a 1984 algorithm. It is probably the most widely used predictive modeling method in industry. I would argue more popular than neural networks. Okay, so why is that? CART is not very accurate. It's not particularly principled. It doesn't really optimize anything. But it's very scalable. You can run it on a very, very large scale. But the key thing is that it produces interpretable models. The models are transparent. They often fit on an index card. And that's why people want to use them. So how does CART, how does CART work? How does the algorithm actually work? Well, um, let's say that CART is trying to predict whether or not I'm going to get stuck in traffic. So what CART would do is it would say, what is the feature that's the most highly correlated with traffic? And it might say, rain. OK. So, um, so rain gives me the most information about traffic, so I'm going to split the data in half based on whether or not it's raining. And then I'm going to continue on with each chunk of the data separately. So I will then look at the pile of data from when it was raining. And then I'll say, OK, what's the feature that gives me the most information about traffic? Is it construction? All right, put construction there. And then we'll split based on construction. And then I'll create my classes. And I do the same thing for the other pile of data. I find features that are correlated with the outcome, plop them in there. And that's how I build the whole decision tree. It's all, it's top down greedy. You split, and then at the end, cart goes back up and prunes nodes that it doesn't think it needs. Okay, so you can see why it scales very well, right? Because it's top down greedy. But you know, what if rain wasn't the right variable for the top of the tree? And the answer is, well, you're stuck with it. But that's the downfall of being greedy. You can't undo it. <laughs> so the bottom line is that CART doesn't actually optimize anything. It's actually top-down greedy. Greedy splitting, greedy going back and printing. So our goal was to build something a little different than CART that would uh, be accurate theoretically principled, give you interpretable models, and be scalable. We were really aiming for accuracy and interpretability. These were constraints. Okay? The model had to be accurate, has to be interpretable, and then within accurate and interpretable models, it should be as scalable as possible. Okay? Scalability wasn't the primary concern here. It was accuracy and interpretability, although we do spend all of our time now working on scaling this thing up. So the, the method is aimed for large but not massive problems where we care about interpretability. Problems like, why is this the best treatment for me? You know, give, me give me a reason why I should take this treatment. What is it about me that makes this thing the right treatment for me? Also questions like, is it fair that I was denied parole? Right? If a neural network or another uninterpretable method spits out, you should be denied parole. Right, because we think you're gonna go out and commit a crime. Well, you know, I can't understand that. I wanna, I wanna know why I was denied parole, or you know, why should I take that drug for the rest of my life? Questions like that, where you wanna know what, not just what the prediction is, but why. People just won't use a model that they don't understand for many, many applications. Okay, so our proposed framework goes like this. First, we reduce the size of the problem. Okay, the size of the problem is very, very large, right? This is an NP-hard problem, produce an optimal decision tree. So the first thing we do is we mine all frequent patterns as potential leaves of this tree. Okay, so we go through the database and just find a giant pile of things that could potentially be leaves or nodes to split in, in actuality. Now, I put a little star there because we also have a theoretical proof that frequent patterns are sufficient in the sense that an optimal decision, an optimal decision tree actually only uses frequent patterns. So if we have all the frequent patterns, that's enough to get us an optimal tree. 
And then we take all the patterns that we mined and we assemble them into the tree. Okay, so we formulate a special optimization problem, which is um, to take these Leap the, these sort of leaves that we assembled and, and create what's called a decision list, which is a form of decision tree. And then, in order to do that optimization, we use a whole bunch of tricks from databases and computer systems. Like, we, uh, we use a lot of reuse of computation, so we don't have to recompute things multiple times. And then we use very efficient bit vector operations so that every computation in this thing is like super, super fast. So decision tree, as you know, may look something like this, where it branches like this. But we're using decision lists, which are very one-sided decision trees. So a decision list may be something like this, like you know, uh, if some conditions hold, then the prediction is blah. Else if other conditions, then predict blah. Uh, and so it's a se sequence of it's if, else if, else if, else if, else if, and then an else at the bottom. Um, decision lists, they're, as I mentioned, they're one-sided decision trees. But if you take a decision tree, you can write it as a decision list by putting each leaf of the tree as a leaf on the list. Okay, So you're not fundamentally losing any computation there. Um, because every decision tree can be written as a decision list. A decision list is automatically a tree. Okay. But computationally, it's easier for us to work with these lists because of the kind of bit vector operations that we're doing. OK, so here's an example of one of these lists that's produced by our code. And this is um, uh, us trying to predict whether a customer is going to churn, which means they're going to leave their cable carrier and go to another one. This is, the, this is a publicly available data set. It's the IBM Watson Telco customer churn data set. And the model says, if the customer has a one-year contract and they use the streaming movie service, then the probability they'll churn is 20%. Else, if they have a one-year contract, which means they don't have the streaming movie service, then the probability they'll churn is 5%, and so on and so forth. This model fits on a slide. It was created in less than a second on a laptop. No greedy splitting and pruning. It's actually optimized for, for what it is. So what does it optimize? I say it's optimized, but what is it actually optimizing? And the answer is that it's, a, it's producing what's called a maximum a posteriori solution of a model called Bayesian rule lists. Maximum a posteriori means compute the posterior and maximize it. That's all it means. So that's where the optimization is. And there are three parameters in this model. It's how many rules the user thinks they might want to be interpretable. Say I want five rules or something, so I put lambda as five. A number of conditions per rule the user would prefer. I usually use one. And then a prior in the labels, like if you want it to favor certain labels over other ones, you can have it do that. Although I always, I don't use this. I just set alpha just to be one all the time. Don't use it. But of course, these are prior parameters. So if you have enough data, the data can overwhelm the prior and overpower what the user thinks they might want. And then this is the function that, uh, this is the posterior for Bayesian rule list. This is what it actually optimizes. And I don't need to tell you what this function means. All I have to do is point to the screen and go, this is a function. It's actually optimizing it, unlike cart, which is optimizing nothing. Okay, so there's my function. Now, let me show you some results from this thing. Now, what I'm showing you is a plot of accuracy uh, versus model size. And higher accuracy is better, and smaller model size is better. The blue dots are cart. We used cart with all different parameters. We sort of fiddled with the parameters of cart. And then these are the models we got. And you can see the models tend to be very small, which is good. However, the accuracy suffers very badly using cart. You never know what it's going to do. Because right? it's so greedy that it just does whatever it wants. But it's never hitting the, the higher levels of accuracy that it could potentially get. Right? So even if you tuned cart, because right? we, we used a whole bunch of different 
We use a whole different bunch of different parameters. And so even if you tuned it, you'd never get up there. And then this is C4.5, which is a different decision tree algorithm. C4.5 tends to produce these very big models, like this is two, up, upwards of 400 leaves. And it's much more accurate, but you know, to get that level of accuracy, you, you clearly sacrifice interpretability, because now you're up to 20 leaves here. Uh, our models are the three red ones over here. There were three folds to this data set. So we, we divided it into three folds. We trained on two, tested on the third. That's why there were three dots, because there were three test folds. And all three times, we're hitting exactly where we want to hit the highest level of accuracy with the <coughs> smallest possible models. So again, this is not a surprise, because CARD and C4.5 are not actually optimized for anything. So here's, here's the uh, a plot of accuracy uh, relative to a whole bunch of even uninterpretable methods. <coughs> what you want to look at is the fact that uh, if, you, if you just limit yourself to the interpretable method for card at C4.5, it's beating it pretty, you know, all the, uh, the, the, uh, the whole kind of, you know, 25th to 75th percentile and, and the whole, you know, the whole box plot is above card in C4.5. And that happens for pretty much every data set. Uh, for the other methods, it's sort of in the middle. Um, you can never tell which of these methods is going to perform better on a particular data set. Sometimes random forest is really good. Sometimes boosted decision trees is, is good. Um, sometimes support vector machines are awful. You never know. But this one's usually somewhere in the middle of the uninterpretable methods. It's, it's not usually at the top. It's somewhere in the middle. But it's at least beating C4.5 and CART for the, inter for the interpretability, which is what we really care about. So it's better than the other interpretable uh, methods, almost as accurate or often as accurate as, as the uninterpretable ones. And here's runtime. We're never going to beat cart because it's greedy. But it's not that bad. So this is less than a second on a laptop. Uh, much better than, say, boosted decision trees or random forests, which take a long time. Now, as I mentioned, the models are small enough to fit on a slide. And I already showed you. Uh, the, the model actually from the one of the red dots in the figure. There were three red dots in that figure. This is one of the models, which I showed you earlier. This is the second model, and that's the third model. So they're all big enough to fit on a slide. And um, there was no parameter tuning here. There's no fiddling with, with you know, fiddly parameters. There's the Bayesian prior. You put in what you want. You let it run. It's not neural networks where you have to fiddle around and try and train it over a period of time and so on. Um, so no tuning, one parameter setting, less than a second, and we get similar results for other data sets. So this is tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac-toe is a fun data set because there's a right answer. Here the computer is trying to learn that three X's in a row means you win the game of tic-tac-toe. And C4.5 and CART really just can't do it. They just can't. I mean, you can kind of see, yeah, they just can't even get close to the right answer. Like, this is like a frontier of what C4.5 and CART can handle. And we always get it right because we're actually optimizing for it. So that's not a surprise. This is the adult data set from UCI. This is a much bigger data set. Um, this is, you know, uh, 45,000 uh, samples. And, you know, so you're getting... 45,000 samples and 100 features, and uh, right now the runtime the runtime listed on here is about 14, 15 seconds. But my student has improved it quite a lot even since that um, since that slide was made, and um, we think we can get it a whole lot faster. Right now, about half the time is pre-processing, and the actual runtime is so fast. All right, so then the question it kind of begs the question: Well. If you can optimize decision trees, if you have full control over decision trees, what can you do with it? So one thing we thought of was to build highly constrained decision lists. And in particular, one of my students called Fulton Wayne has been working on what are called falling rule lists. So this is an example of a falling rule list. And here, the probabilities are forced to decrease along the, as you go down the list. So you're putting the most vulnerable 
say, the most vulnerable patients up on the top, and then the second most vulnerable here, and like that. So for example, this is uh, predicting whether a tumor is malignant. If the tumor has an irregular shape at the age of the patient is above 60, then this is the highest malignancy risk group. If you peel that group off, then this is the second highest malignancy rate group. And if you're not in one of those two groups, well, maybe you could be in the 69% the group and so on. So it's monotonically decreasing as you go down. You cannot create anything like this with a regular decision tree algorithm. It just won't work. It's too greedy. But this one, you can actually do it. And then Fulton has been extending his work to uh, make the falling rule list uh, more closer to causal inference, where you're predicting effects of treatment and not just outcomes. This is an example of a causal falling rule list that he created for predicting the effect of the, um, the effect of being male on hourly wages, and he used the U.S. Census data set to do this. So the rule list says, if your occupation is a professional specialty, like an engineer or a lawyer or something, and your race is white, then the effect of being male on wages is $4.39 per hour. Uh, if you don't fit into this category, but if you're a factory worker and you're not a union worker, then the treatment effect is $2.13 per hour. Okay, and so the nice thing about this, again, is it's as sparse as you need it to be. You, you start at the top, and you know the, the, the people with the highest treatment effect are, are right at the top. So you can go just rule by rule and see how far you need to go before it's, before it's irrelevant, essentially. All right, so the takeaways to this is that uh, this is a new approach to decision trees and other logical models. These new alternatives to decision trees, they're sparse, they're accurate, and they're fast. And they provide insight into data that we currently can't get any other way. Before, there were the alternatives were use a very accurate but uninterpretable model or use an accurate or use an interpretable but not very accurate model. And this is trying to aim like right down the center there. Uh, it uses a lot of um, lot of tools, statistical approximations, analytical bounds, low-level computational techniques like fast language libraries, computational reuse. Every trick we could find, we threw at this problem to try to get us good performance on this. So there's no good reason, as far as I can tell, to continue to use CART. And this opens up new opportunities for interesting forms of models that we couldn't construct previously, like falling rule lists and causal falling rule lists and other types of constrained logical models. If you want to try this out, uh, go for it. There's code on my website. There's also the um, SBRL package on CRAN that you, can, that you can just use, and it should work on any platform. And uh, we'd love to hear your feedback if you do try it. That's Thank it. you, Sintan. Thank you.